Hi folks, Slick Slices here. Um, I'm going to talk about the Higo Nakami knives today. Uh, Higo Nakami is a kind of a trademark term. It was uh, trademarked by the Knife Guild uh, Guild in Miki in um, Japan in the Hyodo Prefecture um, back in the round of the, the turn of the 19th to 20th century. So there are Higunakami knives and there are Higunakami style knives. It's a bit like the Sodbuster and Case. You know, Case trademarked the term Sodbuster in 1967, but they didn't patent the knife. There's nothing unique about the knife. The, the, the pattern of knife goes back to the 1600s in Germany. So you have a similar situation with Higunakami. So there are, there are some knives and some of these are genuine Higo Nakamis made um, by um, the Kanekoma in, in um, Miki in, in, in Japan. They're officially allowed to be called Higo Nakamis. Others are not. So others use terms like Higo and others just simply present their knives as being Higo Nakami style knives like these, these couple here. Um, but they're all, they follow a similar pattern. And I'll give you an idea of where they come from. Back in, from about the 14th, 15th century through to about 1600, you had the um, warring period in Japan where um, various shoguns were trying to, you know, take supreme control over the whole of, of, of Japan. And great oversimplification, but in 1600 there was a big battle called Sekigahara. And in Sekigahara, a guy called Tokugawa um, effectively won and took control of the whole of Japan. He moved the capital from um, uh, Kyoto to a place called Edo. Now, Edo, we now know as Tokyo. And it takes that name from Tokugawa. So it's effectively Tokugawa city, uh, Tokyo. And um, from that period on, Japan went into a, a period of stability and peace. The samurais were very much in charge, but they didn't have any battling to do. And they weren't very much good at very much else. So there was a period of long stagnation in, in many ways. Um, the, uh, you know, the, they were still using um, matchlock uh, muskets by the end of the Edo period, well into the 19th century, when the rest of the world had gone well past that, because they had no need. So weaponry became, um, making it more ornate became more of a thing than making it practical. And things like uh, sword blades became straighter because the only sword play that the samurai was doing would be kendo. And in kendo, a straight blade, the uh, shinai, the wooden sword that's used, is, is absolutely straight. So a sword blade that was straighter made more sense to him. So he ended up with um, uh, going down that sort of route. But the rule of the samurai really came to an end in 1868 when it's Japan really needed to modernize to compete in the world you had the influx of um, the Americans particularly um, coming in at that sort of that period and uh, they really Japan really needed to sort itself out so with the beginning of the Meiji period which came in in 1868 you had pretty much the end of the um, the samurai and but one of the things that always distinguished a samurai was that he wore two swords the daisho uh, a katana and a wakasashi as a rule um and that marked him out as a samurai now he had to wear those to be a samurai nobody else could wear them because they weren't samurai um other people wore swords and other people carried knives so the wakasashi and tanto were very popular and as a result some of the most sort of magnificent pieces that you find from even the late Edo period through to 
the um, what they call the Shin Shinto period, which was the the late Edo period, through from there to the end of the nineteenth century, were the sort of swords that merchants and so forth ended uh, owned. They were relatively low in the social standings, but they were also the relatively rich. The social class in in Japan was odd, and you had the samurai at the top, then the peasants, the farmers, and then the, at the bottom of the, the, the table were the merchants, but the merchants had the money, so they were socially low, but financially high, if that makes any sense. Anyway, in 1868, the end of the... The the swords were banned. You weren't allowed to carry the daisho. You couldn't be a samurai anymore. That was the end of that. So you had a whole industry of people that made swords suddenly out in the rear with nothing to do. And uh, up until that period, if you uh, if you wanted to insult a um, sword maker, you would call him a cutler. Um, because you would be telling him that all he was good for was making kitchen knives, um, you know, which um, you know he wasn't a he wasn't a great swordsmith. <clears throat> but of course, there they were, 1868. No more swords. Swords didn't really come back in to fashion until the early 30s, when in the Showa period we had the rearmament of Japan and the. Um, you know, between 1933 and 1945, they made more swords in Japan than they'd made ever in the history of Japan. It, it really is phenomenal, phenomenal growth. But between 1868 and about 1933, very few swords were made, and those that were made tended to be made in the in a European style. They were copying particularly American uh, cavalry sabers. It seemed to be a sort of common pattern. So anyway, all these sword makers had to find something to do. And one of the things that was done was they started making knives for um, ordinary people. And the Higanakami was a very simple, straightforward, basic sort of a knife. And um, effectively, all it is, you've got a, a blade. Where's the right one here? This one I'll do. This one's a bit stiff, unfortunately. I picked the wrong one. You've got a, a blade in a folded metal. Um, they call it a sheath, actually, in Japan, rather than the sire, as opposed to a handle. Um, but basically, it's just a, a, a folded uh, a metal blade. There is no mechanism. There is no catch. There's no spring. Absolutely nothing. And these can be made in any sorts of steel from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high. Um, mostly they're either blue paper or white paper steel, um, which relates to the colour of the paper that they were wrapped in. Blue paper is more of a pure carbon steel and uh, white paper steel has a bit more, a few more additives in it to make it actually slightly more stainless. But... Um, it's supposed to be a higher quality steel. Anyway, I have a few here and I just want to sort of pick out, this was the first one I ever got. This one, um, my wife bought me this as a Christmas present. And when she got it, she was really disappointed because she was expecting something far more swanky. And she got it and she looked at it and she thought, hmm, it's a bit dull. But what she couldn't understand is why I was so happy about it. Um, they were, and this is, it's pretty basic. I mean, it's brass as opposed to steel. So I suppose it's one up from, from, from basic, but it has some of the, the good quality things in a, in a Higo Nakami. It's made from what's known as a Sanmai steel. That's to say a sandwich steel. So you have a harder steel in the middle and softer steel on the outside. Now I've polished this one up a little bit so you, you can see the line. It's not a ham-on line, it's not a hardening line. It's where the two bits of steel have been um, forge welded together. Um, sometimes you can see it in the spine, but I think I've polished this one a bit too much and you can't really see it. You can see it a little bit in the in the tip there. Anyway, so this is, so there's no mechanism. You've just a, a riveted pivot 
um, and you have a little, uh, uh, I can't remember what it's called, um, words f just left my head, it's like a chiriki or something, the, this little tab on the end, and it's, it helps with opening the knife and it also gives you something to hold it open with when it's open. If you're used to slip joints, I don't think you have too much trouble with these. They're, you know, they're perfectly easy to use. Um, oh, the other thing I meant to say about the blade. Of course, they are sharpened like a sword to a zero edge. There is no micro bevel on them. They just go straight to the edge. Um, this one sort of seems to have gained a slight micro bevel, but that's just because of my poor sharpening. Uh, but traditionally, they have no micro bevel. They just go straight to a zero edge, uh, which is something I kind of like. This one here is a better quality one. Um, I mean, they, they, these vary in price. Y you can get um, these sort of ones um, for oh, under £20. This one here is more like £100. Now, partly that's because it's a little bit larger. It's um, made of brass, but japanned, well, that's to say coloured black. Uh, a giveaway for whether it's a good one or a bad one is often, if you look at this washer here, this one has a sunburst pattern on it, whereas um, the cheaper ones tend to just have just a round, a round rivet like uh, around a washer like that but the better ones tend to have that sort of sunburst um, rivet. Also this one has um, what you might call an American Tanto point. It's a bit like a katana. There is a um, a line here called a Yokoti line um, which differentiates the if you like the Tanto or the Boshi part of the the blade from the main uh, edge of the of the the knife a bit more like a katana you don't tend to see this in in actually in, in japanese tantos so this one's quite unusual this line here instead is called the shinogi line just for those who are interested the back of it's called the moon and the edge is called the ha um and as i say the the, the handle isn't a handle it's, it's known as, as the sheath or the sire of a of a japanese higonakami so but they're the, the the sort of the basic styles the ones with um uh, metal handles folded over this one is steel but the blade is a, a damascus steel but it's still a sanmai steel so although it's Damascus on the outside, or a Damascus style, uh, um, as opposed to a folded metal, this is a more of a decorative thing than folding it in order to get the impurities out in the, in the traditional sword sense of, uh, of, of steel. Um, but it's a sandmai, so you've, you've again, you're cladding two layers of Damascus, one either side of a hard layer of... Um, I think this one's blue paper steel. Now, if I could read Japanese, I, I could tell you what the steel is because I'm pretty sure it tells you in um, in the the writing on the handle. But unfortunately, I did get somebody did do some translation for me of what this means. The the only thing I kind of do know this one's a little bit clearer. This first four little kanji characters together is the word higo. Um, but I, I know that this tells you more, and somebody did translate it for me, but I lost the translation, which is really, really annoying. So, um, as I say, these are the kind of the basic style, this sort of folded metal, and these can come in anything from this sort of tiny little, what you might call keychain. Oh, that's tough to open. Uh, the little um, keychain size knife. I mean, look, that's an inch an inch long this is um you know sort of uh, uh swiss army sd classic size blade almost slightly heavier than the sd classic um you can get little ones like that right up to 
um, you can get bigger ones than this, but you tend not to get so many more than um, three inches in the UK because three inches is, you know, this is legal to carry in the UK because it's under three inches. If it's more than three inches, you're not really allowed to carry them. So you don't tend to see any more, but you do get ones with blades up to four inches. Um, but then you can also get ones that are wooden. Um, now, this one here is actually a Higanakami, um, a genuine Higanakami, um, but it's got a wooden handle and a VG10 blade. I can tell it's VG10 because it says VG10, which does make a bit of a giveaway. It's unusual. Um, also, something about these, they're all what you might call, um, what we would consider to be uh, left-handed knives because... Uh, if you hold them in the left hand, you can see that they may. I think the truth is, though, that the signature, sorry, it's called the may. I think when you're carrying them and you're using them, uh, the the you're, you're showing the may to the world. Um, with Japanese swords, when you're carrying them, as you may or may not know, they're, they're generally carried with the edge upwards. And so when you're, when they're in your sheath, you've got the that side showing to the world so you tend to have the may is on the handle although it's it's on the the tang of the sword which is underneath the the cargo so you can't actually see it but the may is still showing to the world so this is a sort of symbolism in this i think with a knife you're tending to display it to the world that way around so you're showing the world the name of the maker even though in uh as a practical sense, it's hidden by your hand, but you're still showing the the, the name to the to the world. <clears throat> so I think that's probably why they are that way around. Whereas in usually in Western knives, you tend to have the fancy show side on the inside, so that you can so that you can see it whilst whilst you're using it. The Japanese are more interested in showing the world rather than telling you. You know what's in your hand. So <clears throat> that one there is made of a sort of um, what's euphemistically called a packer wood but i think it's just posh plywood really and that's just what that is those ones are available in different colors um and are surprisingly expensive um but if you want surprisingly expensive uh, this little one here which is a tiny little tiny little baby one um with a damascus blade again san mai and a screwed together construction, but with a uh, sort of wooden, I think it's coca bola wood or so, something like that, handle, is um, it's very lovely, but considerably more expensive than some of these little brass and steel ones. But I, I quite like that one. I think it's quite pretty. If you want a little one, but you don't want to pay for um, the fancy materials, you can get one in brass, and these ones cost, I think, under a tenner. Um, or around a tenner, anyway. Um, there are others, and some of these are quite modern, and they're made by um, non-Miki um, uh, uh, Guild members. So they have different uh, makes. This one is a Koto. Uh, this one, again, is San Mai, uh, but it's D2 steel. Now, I don't know whether D2 is presumably the core steel, because I don't know what the outer steels are, or whether the steels are just in some way differently treated. But I can't see how you would do that and um, uh, and San Mai sandwich it as well. Um, so I, I don't quite know how it works but i would imagine the core is d2 and the um outer sides are something else um but i don't i don't know that for certain this one's a little brass, brass screw holding it together and this is a slightly more oh, it's, um it's persimmon wood by the way um on the handle it has a very cheap feel about it but again these are not particularly cheap uh knives koto do um do vg10 as well And then um, 
this one here is again in D2 um, and I can't remember what the wood is this one has a sort of black treatment to the back of the blade so it makes it look a bit more modern and it also has a micro bevel so it's it's a bit different um, to the traditional ones that uh, Koto one has uh, 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 zero edge in the traditional sort of pattern and then of course you can step out of um, the real sort of traditional Higonakamis and you've got knives which are in the style of um, this one again is Japanese, but it's not made in Miki. And this one is, oh, it's, this one has a screw, so you can adjust it, but um, well, it's hard to open. I actually quite like this one. It's um, it's a beautiful knife. Um, I've done a video on it, so you know if you want to see it, it's this is more in a sort of modern traditional sorry a western traditional style you've got liners you've got a backspacer um and it's got as a detent to hold it open but you can see it's coming from the um higo uh higo nakami style i never told you what higo nakami means either did i um higo was a um a, a place an old province in japan on the island of kyoshu and um Today it's uh, Kamamoto Prefecture, but the word um, uh, Kami means governor, and it's the there are four ranks of governor. It was the highest rank of governor, so it's the governor of Higo. Uh, no, of uh, no means of, so Higo no Kami, governor of Higo. Um, <clears throat> other companies, and this is a very mo this is quite a modern. Um, Japanese knife making company uh, just used the term Higo and this one here is a Makusta um, machine custom that's what that stands for and this is a very very lovely knife uh, this is VG10 it's made in Seki City not um, not Miki um, I, I use this knife quite a lot again it's Sanmai and I presume it's VG10 on the inside and VG2 or something on the outside to give it more um, um, strength. Um, you, you can have the hard steel in the core and the softer steel on the outside to give it more, make it more robust. <clears throat> now this has the extended tang and that's um, useful for opening it. It's also useful for holding it open because this is not a locking knife. It does have the a detent but I'm, I'm never sure about these detent knives it seems to be the end thing these days they never hold a knife very uh, firmly open but um, <clears throat> the long tang gives you that security that it's not going to not going to just fold up um, but this actually has quite a positive detent anyway um, so I'm, I'm very fond of this knife it's also it comes in a nice little brocade bag in a in a um, you know, in a, in a fancy box. In, in fact, most of the Higos, with a few exceptions, come in nice little um, boxes. This is a, a you know genuine Higo Nakami. And this one came from uh, Heine Haynes, I think it was that one actually. But they all they all come in these nice few boxes. This this the, the wooden one was in this one, I think. Yes. Yes, that was that, that blue one came in this one. We've got another wee box kicking around here. This little box had um this tiny little tiny little one in it. So when you, when you get the box it looks small. When you open it you find out just how small it is. But uh when you got the box, Higo Bonsai Mokuzai Damascus. So Bonsai, yes, a small Higo. But he, the word Higo Nakami doesn't exist on, isn't on that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> little box is out of the way. 
But if you're going to carry the woody, and that was the, I think that was the, well, that one says Nagao, uh, Nagao, sorry, Nagao, he's going to call me Folder Black, uh, which obviously Nagao is a genuine Higo Nakami. Um, anyway, that's about, there are um, Western knives that would appear to be in a similar vein, things like the Duke Duke, and in a way it is, but um, the, it has a similar handle in this, it's a piece of folded steel, a folded metal, but the blade on the Duke Duke is just a piece of stamped steel, and it's really in no way comparable to the the Higa Nakamis. The Higa Nakamis have a ring of quality, even though they are um, very cheap knives. Um, the other one, obviously, that has the bears comparison um, Western knife is the um, Makata Lockbacks, the black cat knife. Or a K55K. Um, and in a way, I suppose they're similar in that you have the folding metal and you have a blade in it. But again, you don't have that quality. You don't have the sand my steel. You don't have the zero edge. And of course, these are, um, that one is a locking knife. And um, the one final one, I suppose, every Japanese knife maker has to have a knife called the Higo. And some of them are actually quite exceptional knives, of course. This one here, the Rockstead Higo, um, which uh, is a, a modern take on the principle, has nothing in common with the Higo Nakami, except that it actually has an exceptionally high quality blade, um, which clearly this one could do with a clean, because I, be, I, I use this regularly. Um, it's a great everyday knife. But um, it doesn't really have much in common with the, uh, the Higo Nakami tradition, except that it is also called a Higo, in just the same way as the Makusta is called a Higo. So anyway, that's a brief run through some of my Higo Nakami knives. I don't know whether um, it's worth doing individual videos on any of them in particular, but I'd be more than happy to do that if anybody is, is interested. I mean, these are particularly available on Heine Haynes. These are available on Moonraker. These are available on Heine Haynes. These are available, funnily enough, on AliExpress. Um, and I think these are available on both Heine and Moonraker knives. Um, these all came from... Well, that was a trade off Congies, but it came from Moonraker. Um, the rest of them, I think, have mostly come from either Heine or... or um, or Moonraker um, and you know they're things I will continue to collect and add to my collection from time to time um, as appropriate I like Japanese knives I like Japanese things I'm a bit of a Nihontophile um, anyway there we are if you like your stuff give a thumbs up if you want to um, uh, see more of them please subscribe and you uh, ring the bell if you want notifications okay thank you very much see ya bye